Hello everybody and welcome to our event this evening. I'm Nikki Gamble from Just Imagine and tonight we're going to be celebrating Richard O'Neill's latest book for children. Um, before we begin though, a few things. Uh, as always, we want to encourage you to take part in this event. Uh, the chat is open. So please feel free to introduce yourselves uh, to each other. I know there are many people joining us this evening who know each other. Uh, so you will be able to see your friends if you join the chat online. And also if you'd like to leave your questions as well uh, in the chat and we will be picking them up from there. So I'm going to bring Richard into the scene and introduce him. Uh, and I am so thrilled uh, that with Scholastic Children's Books, we must mention Scholastic this evening, that I have the privilege of being able to introduce you and talk to you about your book tonight. Now, Richard, you are a Romany, you're a former professional football coach, you're a playwright, you're a storyteller, you're an author, including an author of children's books. And I dare say there are many other things that you are that I've left out. But which of those do you kind of use first when you introduce yourself? Or are they all equally important? They all have been important. They've, they've all got me to this stage. They're all part of my journey. But if anybody ever asks me what I do, then I think I still say storyteller because everything that you've mentioned was had a big part of story in it. So I think, you know, without without story, there, there wouldn't be much communication. That's how we communicate with each other really effectively. Um, without stories, there wouldn't be any plays. Without stories, you know, plays, books, TV, film scripts, animation scripts, which I write as well. Without story, there wouldn't be any of them. They're, they're just stories in different formats, aren't they? Stories with mm -hmm. pictures, stories in different formats. Can I ask you whether storytelling was also important to you when you were a professional football coach as well. It was because, you know, sometimes we'd have team talks and, and, and things might not have gone well on a Saturday for a particular club. And, and anybody who understands sport, anybody who's ever played sport, they will say that the biggest thing you need is confidence and that confidence gets knocked. And I think what you can do with stories, you can, you can really change how people feel and you can change how people think. And I remember being in a half time, um, along with the in the player with the players and the manager at half time and we were and I say weak as I was part of the team we were two nil down and we needed to win to have a chance of even staying up in the in the professional football league and so I actually just started to you know the manager was talking about tactics and all that kind of stuff and I think the players were starting to glaze over because of the, they were starting to realize that this could be the end of their league football and of course, you know, as a player, your value goes down, your self-worth, but also your actual worth goes down if you get kicked out of the league. And I just thought, you know, I just need to, to talk to them here and tell them a little story, and, and, and which I did. And I said, you know, the, how, how often do you get a chance to be a hero? Very few of us ever get the chance to be a hero. You know, I love films with heroes and books. But in real life, you very rarely get the chance to do that. And, and you know, and I said, you have the chance to go out and be the hero today for all the people who are at home, all the people who are watching. Um, and you know, it's it's about emotion, isn't it? Once we can we can click into that emotion, then that will motivate us. You know, people say motivation, but I think it's emotivation really. I think it comes from emotion, um, and that's what the best stories do, don't they? They they they, they change how we feel about things and and that's what I think I've always tried to do with my storytelling is to mm -hmm. is to allow people to feel something you know when I watch a film or a play or read a book I want to feel it I want to you know and, and there is that common parlance where you know young people have said you know do you feel me man do you feel me you know you know and it is is true are you feeling it are you are you feeling it and and that's and I think that's where I'm coming from with all of my stuff I want people to to feel something about about what my work um, yeah, so it's a long way around of answering a very simple question, that wasn't it? Well, it's really interesting because already you've tapped into so many things that we'll probably cover again when we talk about the book, um, both the football and the storytelling and the moments at which stories are told and why they're told. 
But before we get there, and before we introduce the story itself, um, for our viewers uh, this evening, some of them will know you already. I know for a fact that they do, and they've seen you in action. Uh, but some won't, and they'll be curious, and they'll be curious as to who you are and how you came to be writing children's books. So I wonder if you can take us on a little bit of your journey uh, so, and tell us a bit more about yourself. I'll go right back to the start, actually, um, and tell you a little bit about me. So I am one of the the last people to be a born fully nomadic into an English Romani family. We use the word gypsy sometimes, which is a, a shortening of Egyptian, because when we came here 500 years ago, originally King Henry VIII's people thought we were from Egypt because we spoke French, because we'd come from France, but we spoke another language which they couldn't really fathom, and they thought, which, which actually was Romani. But they thought, oh, that's a bit strange. So they thought, and we were slightly darker, and we wore brighter clothes and quite a lot of gold. And they thought we were Egyptians. That was their frame of reference. Shakespeare noticed this because in Othello, he mentions an Egyptian woman. And then as time goes on with Shakespeare, then we get to As You Like It. And he says, fie, fie, like two gypsies on a horse. And that's what we do in English, don't we? We shorten language. So, you know, we, 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 we call the fish and chip shop now the chippy or whatever. So we, we always love to shorten these languages. And so I grew up in that Romani family. Now, my dad was born in a horse-drawn wagon. So if you've seen Peaky Blinders, it was a bit like that, but real. And so my dad was born in a horse-drawn wagon. I was a rag and bone person and did all kinds of other things. So when I came along, it was the 1960s and we lived in caravans. And that was a huge change. My dad hadn't seen much change in his life apart from the motorization um, transport-wise rather than mainly horses. But when I came along, it was the start of modern times if, as we know it. If, you, if you're a similar age to me, or, or, but if you think about your school, your secondary school, your hospital, your doctor's surgery, maybe when you were a kid growing up, they were all built round about the late 50s, early 60s. Massive housing estates, social housing, private housing, motorways, widening of roads. And that all came at the cost to people like us because our traditional stopping places where we would stop, you know, we were fully nomadic. So we didn't have caravan sites, we didn't have houses. And, and that sort of came around us and encroached on our lives. And then by the time I was about five years old, then we were having to find places to stay in our caravans, lived in a house for a while and then back in caravans. And so all of my life I've been in and out of houses and caravans. I live in a house at the moment, um, but then I live in a caravan sometimes. So I've always been in and out of those. And I guess what it what it did, it gives you a gives you a, a culture that you grew up with, which which was a storytelling culture. A lot of the old people I grew up with, they spoke Romani or Rumness, as they would sometimes call it, uh, more than English for the older people, because I spoke mo mostly English. Um, I was about four years old when I got my first book, and it was a ladybird called oh. On the Farm. And I was fascinated. I loved story. I'd grown up with the, some of the best storytellers, and that's how we communicated, because a lot of the people that I knew and my family couldn't read and write. My dad could read a little bit, and he could write a tiny bit, but I think he'd probably had maybe a day at school here, a couple of days there. He hadn't really had much schooling at all. So I had got this book, and I, I memorised it, and I, I always think about, you know, Beethoven or Mozart, perhaps, when they were younger and people would come around and they'd play and people would be amazed this five or six-year-old could, could play this music. Well, I was like that um, with sort of a lot of my older relatives, but I couldn't actually read the book at first. I just memorised it. But that was my first book and I fell in love with books at that point and, and, and I was a bookhead and I realised that books could teach me about other cultures, other worlds, and educate me as, as I went along. And then, but when I went to school, that was really interesting because I lived a very um, free range existence, you know, the difference between battery hens and, and free range hens. So I kind of lived a very free range existence. And then I went to school and everything was timed and you were kind of shut in and you had to sit and had to do this and you had to do that. And everything smelled different and everything tasted different and everything sounded different. So it was a it was a very interesting um, experience going to school. So, but I loved the books. There was books. There was more books than I'd ever seen before. Um, so that was good. So that was my life. And then I carried on um, 
as growing up and, and living in and out of um the traveling community and the settled community and backwards and forwards mm-hmm. um and then just was very very fortunate i think to be able to earn my living doing some of the things you know my dad always said to us you know as long as it's honest and decent and and he, your main job you can do whatever you want but you have to be able to keep yourself you know you know you have to be able to earn your own living so i did my mum and dad did um old fashioned furniture they were we were sort of i guess we call it upcycling now um, so I, I learned my carpentry skills. I learned all of those skills growing up from some of the very best people and went on to work in construction, but always wanted to write, always wanted to tell stories, which I did at family gatherings. And then I think it'd be almost 20 years ago now, somebody said, um, we'd heard about you and would you come and do this family event for us, this storytelling event in Manchester? And, you know, when you say yes to something, because you think, yeah, 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 it sounds, yeah. And then afterwards you think, oh, gosh, I wish I had done that, you know, because um, how am I going to do it? I'd never done it professionally before, just for people, you know, in the family, which I knew. And I went along to this event in Manchester, and I reckon I was all right. But I was all right enough for them to ask me back. And then that just that just snowballed, really, from there. And, and I was working with, uh, I was asked to go and, do some work with some schools, different organizations. And then one day, this woman, we were having a chat and she said, what's the plan? I said, what do you mean, what's the plan? She said, what's the plan um, for the story for your storytelling? And I said, I don't really have a plan. I was just enjoying the ride here, you know, because um, I'm getting paid for something that I never used to get paid for. And this is quite good. And then that's when I started to think about writing. And, and then I wrote my first play in 2005 and that was performed up at Edinburgh. It was on Radio 4. Um, and that's, that's just been the journey ever since. I just love words. And, and, and sometimes when you write your words down, people like them and sometimes they don't. And, you know, the play chimed. Some other things I wrote didn't chime. Um, and then somebody asked me, did I want to put some of my traveller stories into picture books, which I did. Um, and then we've just gone on from there, really. It's, mm. I think you, you just do a number of projects, and if you get really good at it and you work hard, um, then it kind of turns into a career. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, people like me from my background, and a lot of people would be the same, you know, you didn't know an author, you didn't have anybody in the family who was an author, you know, an author was, might as well have been an alien. Um, so I didn't set out to be an author I would have perhaps if you'd asked me when I was a kid I would have probably wanted to be um a farmer um yeah I think I probably want to be a farmer yeah I love you know when people's life histories evolve rather than go along a set path that's always the best way <laughs> you kind of fall into fall into the next thing um and I think again you've just talked about lots of things that come up in this in this story and we're going to revisit them and I think it's a good time now actually to start to tell people a little bit about a Romani story a, a different kind of freedom a Romani story which is one of the voices series published by Scholastic it's an own voices series it's history uh, through own voices um, and I do think one of the successes of the past five years has been to get more stories out reflecting the children that we have in our classrooms. But it's also true that traveller stories are woefully, I mean, apart from you, (laughs) who else is (laughs) writing them? I mean, I do have an old collection, which is called Spokes, you might well know that, but very few. So we're really, you know, especially pleased uh, that you um, have written this book. So tell us a little bit about it. You you have chosen Rab Howell as your historical yeah. character, um, mm. but you've chosen a particular way to tell this story as well. Yeah, I've, I've always been a, a big fan of Rab Howell. And Rab Howell was a Victorian footballer, one of the first ever professional players uh, in England, went on to play for England a couple of times. And he he played for Rotherham, Swifts and then he moved on to play for Sheffield United one of the first real professional clubs he got into a bit of a tr- bit of trouble I guess he was the sort of you know the George Best or um, a, you know Gazer of his day and he was then quickly moved out of the club and he signed for Liverpool in 1898 for 200 pounds 
which was a lot of money back then. He went to Preston after that and broke his leg while playing for Preston and then went after that sort of retired but opened a business. So just, just I was just fascinated by this man who, a bit like, say, my granddad or great-granddad, born in a wagon and somehow then just got into football. He just fell in love with this game and he pursued it. And he must have been really, really good. Um, and it's, it's really always really interesting because when I find my signed my first contract to work in professional football, that was 1998. And Rab had gone to Liverpool in 1898. So was like 100 years between us. And we're, again, I was the only person working in, in, in that kind of job back then in, in 1998. And so I always wanted to, I wrote a play about Rab, um, but it it just didn't really work very well. And then I was approached um, by voices uh, and they said, you know, would you, would you like to write something? Because we don't have a Romani story in there. And I said, well, what would you, what do you, have anything that you want me to write about? I said, no, no, it's up to you, entirely up to you. Um, And there was a, there was one other person I would have written the story about, but then I thought, no, actually, Rab. So I tried to write about Rab, but the only problem is with Rab is we don't know that much about him. We've got his um, his football career very well documented. You know, football people are like, we just love stats. And it's very well documented. But his actual life and because he, well, the truth is uh, he left his wife and children and he went off with someone else. So you could imagine in Victorian times how shocking that was for the football club, for everybody else, for his family. Um, so there wasn't really any information. So, And some of the information that's on Wikipedia, surprise, um, is, is wrong. So, it, you know, that just gets people keeps putting that, putting that, putting that out there. Um, there were certain things, and you see, what I know, and I guess what anybody else from a different community would know, it is the the inner workings of it. And I, I knew that with somebody like Rab, when it came to census time, you've got people who were generally back then were illiterate. But if, if you were in an area and it was census time, the police would come with the census man and they would make you, they would force you to fill this census form in. So what you would probably do, you would probably say a certain thing uh, you would say probably what you thought would, wouldn't get you into any trouble. And the way you spoke with that Romani accent, then your name might even be put down wrong. Mm. So, you know, I, I know there are people these days who have a particular name, that is their, their surname, but it's not the original one because it was it was misheard mm. by the census person and that was them then from then on, they, they, that was their name. So knowing about all those kind of inner workings, and I was very fortunate to still have some very old community members who I was able to tap into who had heard stories from their elders back then. So I was able to piece together, but there wasn't enough um, to do this all about rap. And what I didn't want to do was to make things up about rap because I thought that would just be culturally, for me, it wouldn't be acceptable. Um, I wouldn't want anybody making stuff up about me. And then on the other side of it, you know, we know now with digital, we're, we're, we're discovering new things all the time. So, you know, imagine writing a book like this and then 12 months down the line, a letter or something turns up in an archive and it's digitized and put out there and it makes the book and me and the publisher look really silly because we, we haven't checked that kind of stuff. So I decided to use Rab again as this, as this guide um, and he comes, he makes an appearance in at the end, very positively, he comes in at the end of the book. But I just wanted to have this young person called Elijah, or Elijah for short. And it's about his story and it's about him trying to get into football and just trying to sort of make his way. And, and you know, I think one of the things about stories that really connect with people, it doesn't matter what community you're from or... It's there are connections and the connections are really, really important. So you could read this book and you will find that certain things come up. You know, there, there are lots of us and, you know, I'm a granddad now and, and, I, and I obviously was a parent as well. But there are things that you say or do with or for your children that you think you're protecting them. 
but it, it may come across to them that you're being horrible, you're being harsh, you're being this or whatever. And, you know, Elijah's dad at first might come across as, you know, as quite a harsh person, doesn't want anything to do with football, don't want anything to do with it. And I think it's a bit embarrassing for him amongst the other travellers, but I think he maybe he knows about Rab Howell and, and you know, he doesn't want Elijah to, to get into that world. You know, that, that old thing they used to say, you know, <laughs> don't put your daughter on the stage. Um mm. And don't let your son join a rock and roll band, you know. Um, so it's I mean, there is a of... scene. Sorry, so I didn't mean to cut across no, no, you, Richard. No. There is a scene later in the story where Lige's dad meets Rab, and they actually get on really well. <laughs> yeah. After the initial awkwardness. Yeah, and it, you just reminded me actually because there is a bit in the book where there was an adult reading the book, and again, you know, it, it's. It, it's it, an adult can read it. There, there is, there is some good stuff in there, and it, and it's not, a, it's not an easy read, shall we say? Um, but there was an adult reading it, and and, and got, got to a certain point where an incident occurs, and this adult said, "Why have you been so horrible to Elijah?" I said, "Well, because he's, you know, he's doing what he shouldn't do, you know, and this is the old days. You're supposed to, you know, those days you children are supposed to see, not heard, but you're supposed to, you listen to your parents and and your elders and that kind of thing. So, um, in t- in terms of that, I think you know it links to when I was growing up. I was obsessed with football. So for the first time, I'd, I'd got football. I went to school and I was playing football. I'd be about maybe about seven at that time, and I was just obsessed with it. George Best was the the big hero of the time, and I was just obsessed with football. I wanted to be a football, but there was nobody else in my family, an extended family, who played football. You know, I'd go to caravan camps, you know, with a football under my arm, and people would be like, you know, what 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 on earth is he doing? So my dad, God love him, I had no interest in football at all, none whatsoever. But he would stand there and he would let me kick the ball towards him for like a good half an hour. And he had no interest in it. And that, you know, to me is the most beautiful thing um, when a parent does that. You know, mm-hmm. I do it to some extent with my grandson video games. I have no interest in them, but we end up playing them because that's what you do. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the football was, was, you know, completely alien to my dad. Wasn't interested in it at all. But I mm-hmm. carried on and, and I found, as, as Elijah does, that it actually, if you get good at something, whatever that may be, you know, a lot of comedians will say, I was funny and I made friends. Um, and I think it's the same with sport. You know, if you get good at something, then it, it cuts across a lot of that. People want you if you're good mm-hmm. at sport. They want you in their team. Yeah. It's interesting because when you were talking about your own background, you talked about the 1960s as a period of big change. And this story takes place against a backdrop of big change as well. The industrialization uh, of agriculture, for example, where many of the traveling communities that you are talking about would have depended on for um, you know, their regular routes and, and income. Uh, the industrialization in the big cities and the coal mining and, and all of those things. So obviously huge change has had a huge impact on the lives that nomadic peoples can live do you think along with that has come the sort of negative attitudes that they've had to deal with as well or do you think that was always there from what you've said about Henry VIII I get the feeling that possibly it's got a longer history it's it's interesting isn't it because you know we we always want a bogeyman we always want um somebody to be scared of it's really interesting because Gypsy people as characters have been used as heroes and devils. So on the one hand, we like Heathcliff, you know, because he's handsome and he's exciting and he's dangerous, but not too dangerous, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and then we always want people to look down on and we always want people to be scared of, you know. And there was a rhyme when I was, even when I was growing up. And this rhyme I used to say, my mother said, you never should play with the gypsies in the wood, you know, because they would take you away. Ludicrous. My, gra- my dad was one of 14 children. Imagine my granny waking up one morning and going, oh, do you know what, I, I really need another one. Um, I really do, but someone else has to look after. That would be, you know, my, my ultimate goal. Um, so I think we do. And then I think when we get to more modern times, then, you know, in every community you've got people who are bad, people who are criminals, people who are this, people who are that. But we always show 
the negative. That's what news is about, you know, selling bad news, isn't it? You know, it's, and now it's about clicks or the, the more exciting, the more interesting, um, then we can put that stuff on there. Then, then that's good for the, you know, they aren't really newspapers anymore. They're, they're sensational, mm -hmm. sensational, um, internet properties, mm -hmm. aren't they really? That's all they are. Um, mm -hmm. purveyors of, uh, titillation, I think for clicks. So yeah, we, we've, I, and I, it's really interesting, isn't it? How the Romani gypsy people, it's like, you know, even going back to the gypsy scholar in the 1500s, you know, who leaves his, his, his school in Oxford to, to go and have this easier life. And it's not an easy life though. That's the thing, you know, in the book, it starts off in winter. And I was just reflecting on this as I had my tea in my nice little warm room tonight. Um, and about, you know, living in a caravan when I was an adult, you know, and married. And this time of year, the water is outside in, in a big, you know, metal container. And you're breaking the ice on the water so you can fill your kettle. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a hard life. And you, there's a lot of people who, who do, they say, well, you know, I, I, I live in a van or I live in a tiny house. And I say, yeah, we, we created, we invented that. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and, but um, the few of them I've seen now, they've been TikToking and whatever. And they say, yeah, I'm going to stay with my parents. It's got too cold. Um, you know, so imagine living in a wagon in the winter, yeah. you know, this, this outside now and live, living in a wagon, hard life, yeah. tough life. Definitely. Um, just while we're talking about that and the choices that people have, whether to live in a wagon or a boat or, you know, a narrow boat or a house, um, Elijah's brother, Henry and his new wife, Genty take the decision to move into a house so that she can start a business. And um, I found that story really uh, touching. Um, uh, there, there's a quote here where he says, I, I know you weren't happy about me and Genty leaving and going into a house, but it's something we had to do. We're still Romani people. We still think like travellers, we still feel like travellers. And one day we might go back to travelling, but for now we want to start a business doing something different, a different kind of freedom, if you like. And there's lots of things in my head uh, just around that one quote, but I just want to pick up, I think, on that idea of what you are is more than where you live. Yeah. We still think, we still feel like that. So can you talk to that a little bit? That's, that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, you know, there, there are always people, aren't there? And I, and I think there's probably be people watching us tonight who are from different communities, different backgrounds, and they've stepped out. And I'll give you a, before I go back to that, I'll give you a, a for instance, because it's not just about, um, you know, people like myself. I was talking to somebody who was similar age to me, and they were born and brought up in the northeast of England in a, a coal mining um, village pit village as, as we would call it and he had clever clever lad he'd gone to got to grammar school went to go to university the only one in the street and a and, and few streets around gone to university it was a big thing but when he went away he, he desperately wanted that for himself but when he went away he realized that he viewed where he came from differently they viewed him differently you know, and it, a lot of it was done in a little bit of banter. But every time he came back from university, of course, he spoke different, he dressed different. And they nicknamed him the prof, you know, and that was that was their way of, of kind of dealing with it. So I think you do, you can go and you can change and you can do different things. But I think it changes you. You know, it, it changes you. Um, I mean, sometimes I think it's easier just to to just do one culture and not two. So, you know, I, I, I wrote a monologue called The Chameleon. And there's a there's a man and he's standing and, and he's similar to me in, in that respect, he, where he comes from, but he's sort of gone into a different different world. And he takes his child to the zoo and they're looking at the, the chameleon and she's reading the, the, the description of the chameleon. And she says to him, uh, and he realizes he is a chameleon, uh, as, as a lot of us are sometimes. You change where you go. And the girl says, the daughter says to him, she says, how does it know when it's ever really been itself? Mm -hmm. And there is that. And, and that's I think that's one of the one of the difficult things. So I think when Genty and um, 
his brother move, leave will they will they go back will they keep that connection will they keep the language um will they say to people will they out themselves and say we're romani people or will they just try and fit in you know, and, and I know there are a lot of people who are quite famous, well known, working ordinary, you know, jobs, uh, uh, some of them work in teaching, academia, whatever you want, wherever. And they they have got Romani heritage, but they won't talk about it and they won't come out because they know the the issues that that will cause. And I respect that. I would never out anybody, but it, it must be really, really difficult leading what is almost like a double life. I'm fortunate in that I'd rather take the, the flack that you get um, mm. than, you know, I'd, 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 I don't want to be a chameleon in that sense. I just That's want to be really me. interesting because there are characters in this story. I mean, Rab Howe being one of them, you know, who was doing something that was considered to be different to what his community would do. And then there's another character who I think might be based on a, a real, you know, the preacher. I don't know if that is, he is based on Jigsaw. Yeah, yes, there was, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was, there was a, there was a real revivalist movement back in Victorian times. And there was a preacher called Gypsy Smith and he actually traveled to America as a preacher and huge crowds would come out and people, you know, would convert or uh, they would go down his way. Um, but getting back to um, Rab, you know, there's a cautionary tale, isn't there, for all of us. We use story all the time. We'll say, look, you don't want to end up like that person. Look what happened to them. They went off down to London. They did this, look where they are. Um and, and I think we also look at those negatives. It didn't work out particularly well at that point for Rab. You know, would he have been happier? Would he have been better off staying with his family and just playing football for fun? Mm -hmm. But I think perhaps a lot of people who are watching this will be driven. You know, I'm, I'm driven to create the best story that I possibly can. You know, children will often say to me in school and they'll say, uh, what's your favourite book? And I always say the book I'm working on at the moment, because if it isn't, I'll think that that's it. I can't top that one. I can't, you know, do anything different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Rab and Elijah, the character are obviously driven and it's a good thing in many ways, but it's maybe not a good thing in some ways. And I want children to understand that, you know, this is, this is for sort of eight, well, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever upwards. And, and I want them to understand some of that mm. that you know choices you make you you usually have to give something up to get something and that's i think one of the you know we have this thing and i, I called it the nomadic way a lot of the teachings that we learned growing up it's really interesting because people will say now they'll say oh um there's this movement about circular economies okay yeah yeah we invented that um and recycling <laughs> you're welcome um but you know it, it's you you can only take so much with you when you're moving so, you know, my dad and, and all the old people would say, you, you, you've got to give something up to get something. You can only carry so much in a caravan or on a cart or whatever. And, and I think we don't really teach that. And I, and really I think that's interesting. Mm. The bigger the house is, the more stuff you need to fill it. Yeah. So, I, I mean, there's so much that I want to talk to you about, and I do want to give uh, these audience questions a chance as well. But as we have quite a lot of teachers online today, and, and Rab going to school is a, is a feature in this book, and as we haven't heard you read anything yet, and, and I'd love to hear some of the story, I wonder whether there's a bit about Rab at school maybe that we could here um, or, or anything that you prefer yeah there, there is but it isn't it isn't, it isn't uh, very positive but uh, anyway um what what i wanted to do is as again you know especially for you teachers and and you will know how sensitive and and how amazingly switched on children are i can remember being in a school a few years ago with before i had these these reading glasses and uh there's children sat in front of me about seven eight years old and this boy said I said, yeah. He said, Mr. O'Neill, he said, do you need glasses? And I had actually been thinking I need to get my eyes tested because it's starting to be a bit blurry. And I said, uh, I think I do. He said, yeah, my grandma did. That's She was moving the book away from her as well. And he just spotted those little things. So I'll read you this little bit here. Um, and it's about 
children being per perceptive and, and, and being quite sensitive to things. So this is chapter two. We already knew there was something wrong when we got within earshot of the camp. It was too quiet. My dad handed the reins to Henry and walked towards the fire where my mum was stirring whatever was cooking in a big black pot. As we parked the cart up, we heard my dad's raised voice. Too many people come round poking their knack into our business, Cushy, he said, using my mum's name, which meant it was serious. Everyone knew my mum as Cushy, a nickname she got when she was little and tried to say the word Cushy, which means very good. My brother Henry was named after my dad because he was christened Henry, even even though there was too many Henrys in the family already. I was called Liger after the man in the Bible. Henry glanced over at me. Those census people from the local authority, they must have been round again, he said. I swallowed. The census people collected information on everybody who lived in houses and they made sure they did it to travellers too. The last time they'd come round with the police, they told my mum and dad I needed to be in school, otherwise they'd alert the school board. There ain't no point in him going to school, my dad snapped, proving Henry right. He never learned now anyway. He ain't going to be a scholar, is he? My mum hissed. Do you want a school board man around again, Abe? Next time he said he'll have you in front of the magistrate and mark my words, he'll do it. Why can't these people leave us alone? Our Elijah isn't, isn't nearly too old for school anyway. He ain't going to get a job like the other boys anyway. He's going to work with me. Did you tell him that? Of course I did, but it don't make any difference to them. It's their rules and they will call the law on us. I don't want him picking up gorgeous ways, talking like them or acting like them with all their rajness, dinlos. Well, I'm sick of having to up sticks and shift to another town when the school board are out, said my mum angrily, stirring the pot. I've had years of it, I'm not doing it no more. The animals in the fields have a better life than us. So it's that feeling already that they're being hunted. They, they, they need to be, you know, and we have this thing, don't we, you know, in, in, in countries like ours where we, everybody has to be counted, everybody has to be homogenized, it, it's, you know, it, bureaucracy. And even when I was a kid, you know, my dad used to have this thing about anybody who carried a briefcase that came anywhere near us, it was never to bring us good news. Mm. It was always going to be bad news. And, and and this is what, you know, Elijah's dad just thinks he just needs to be like he was when he was a kid. You don't need to go to school. You don't need to do that. But he does because it's the law. And in Sheffield, they actually had the kids at that time in school longer than anywhere else. They, they had to go until they were 13. And usually they'd be like maybe 12. Um, so he has to do another year. And for his dad, a bit like my dad when I was at school, because I left school um, just before I was 13. And, you know, I was my dad's right-hand man as a worker. So every day I was at school, I was costing the family money. You know, I was a part of my family's economy. And, and that's, that's how we were. And, and you know, the school, obviously school didn't understand that. Can I just ask or, or let people know, Richard, if they don't already know, that you have written about education for nomadic peoples, which I was fascinated uh, to hear. And thank you for sending me. Um, a copy of that. Um, can you say a little bit about that and how people can get hold of, uh, can they purchase that somewhere? Yeah, they can actually. It's called School for Nomads and we've just put it up um, on Amazon as a, as a download. Um, so you can download it for, for a Kindle. Um, it's called School for Nomads. It just went up actually yesterday. Um, so it is available. And again, it's about this, this circular thinking and you know, especially because these are two girls in secondary school and, and I did a lot of research talking to young people before I wrote the book. And I was just comparing and contrasting the last 50 years of education from when I first went and where we are now. And, you know, with technology, which I think I, as nomadic people, we've always been interested in useful technology. You know, when vehicles came and modern caravans, it meant we could go further. We'd have we had better accommodation. It was much better in the winter. Um, than, than a canvas roofed um, wagon. So, but I think we have to use that caveat of useful technology, not technology for technology's sake. And these two, these two girls are in school and one is very, very, um, one is a gypsy, one is an Irish traveler and, and the English gypsy girl, she just doesn't want anybody to know about her identity. She wants to, she realizes it'll just be less trouble if she keeps her head down. 
Whereas the Irish traveller girl, she's just full of herself. She just doesn't care. You know, she tell I don't care. I'll tell everybody. And it's a wonderful thing to have confidence like that. But, you know, it's, it's not as common um, as we would want it to be amongst young people. And, and they have a conversation with the, the uh, SLT in school and explain to them how they think and how they work and actually how they could adapt. And I think for me, you know, it's not just about traveller kids in school because I work in schools and I sometimes do inputs for curriculum and stuff now. And, and, but it, and especially with, you know, the pandemic and everything that happened and we had all the home learning and stuff. But, you know, there are a lot of, and I say this as somebody with ADHD, there's, there's a lot of neurodiverse children in school now. And, and I think we need to try and work around that. And I'm not saying it's an easy job at all because I, I actually don't think I could do your job being with 30 children every day and, and teaching everything and doing what you do. It's, it's a really, really tough job. I'm like, the, I get the best job, you see. I'm like the granddad who goes in, does a few stories, oh, look at this book, and then I'm gone. You know, um, but yeah, I think I think we could we, we we need to think a bit more circular. I think, and I, I think there are things in the um, from the nomadic culture that we can learn and we can use mm. and we can adapt for sure. Really interesting. Now, I just want to pick up Kieran's point here. It's not a question, but I'm going to turn it into a question because it's something okay. that I really love. She's talking about the authentic language in the book, and yeah. when we were talking earlier, I said I loved how you've done that because. You do have to work a little bit to understand it, but there's a glossary. Um, but you haven't done that thing of, you know, the next character who speaks explains it for you. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the thinking that went on in terms of what to put in and, and what to leave out. That's a, that's a, that's a really, really good question. Um, what I always say to, to everybody, to children and to adults, you know, it's, there's, this, there's this idea that we have, and, and I think films and, and TV perpetuated that there's a writer with a, a typewriter or a, a laptop or whatever, um, and they sit very, very solitary, and they write this thing, and they pull it out, and they send it off, you know, all typed up, and they send it off to their publisher, and their publisher goes, hmm, that's another hit, um, excellent. And it doesn't work like that. It's very collaborative. So, you know, you will get somebody to um, commission a book like this, perhaps. And then what I will do, I will write down exactly what I think it, it would be like, what it would look like, you know, synopsis or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then we start to write it as a writer. And then if you get very lucky, like I have with this book through Scholastic, you get a really good editor. And an editor is they're almost like another writer in a way. They're, they're, they're just so, so good. They're like, they're like a coach. Um, I love editors and I work with lots of different editors and they're just so great. And they tell it like it is, you know, they don't sugarcoat it. They go, what were you thinking? Um, what, what's that about? That doesn't make sense. Um, you've already said that in chapter three. Um, but it's that lovely guidance that you have. So the editor will look at it and they'll go, mm, I think there's a bit missing here. I think it's a bit there, it's a bit there. And then you've got people who will proofread it for you, which it would be a nightmare for me because, um, you know, I, ADHD perhaps is some of it, but once I finish something, I don't really like going back to it. Um, so it's a it's a collaborative thing. It's a it's a real um, and then the language was just part of it. So so you're playing around all the time. You know your your editor is looking at it, you're looking at it, and the editor's giving you some suggestions or something that doesn't stand out. Or and then you know if you're very lucky, like I was getting a great editor, then you're still allowed to have the feel, you're still allowed to, to be in charge of it. You know, you're driving the bus, but you've got somebody directing you, shall we say, use that analogy. Um, and the language, it's really interesting because a lot of the words, a lot of Romani words, we can tell how long Romani people have been in England because a lot of the words people go, oh, I didn't know that was a Romani word. Uh, I come from London, we say mullered for, for killed, you know. Cushy, I thought that was Wonga, people use Wonga. I think there's even a yeah, website. Exactly. <laughs> And no. I, you know, picking up on the gypsy that we talked about earlier, um, gypsy with a capital G, it needs to be yes. capitalized. And that's the legal term, isn't it? That's, it is. It is. And, but, and, and, some, and some people don't like, you know, some, some Romani people don't like the word gypsy. I, I don't mind the word gypsy. It's just, it's just, you know, when I was a kid growing up, it would have something perhaps nasty in front of it. You know, the word dirty or something worse. Um, I don't mind the word gypsy. And it is a legal term, you know. So there mm. are Irish travellers are a separate ethnic minority group. They're a legal mm. ethnic minority group. 
um, as are Roma people who, you know, mm -hmm. as I always say to my one of my, my good friends who's Roma, um, who comes from uh, Central Europe, and I say, yeah, you know, we, we're both the same, me and you, but we got to be 500 years first, you know, <laughs> well well before you, half, half a millennium. Um, but and it's just while we're being really competitive, interesting that, Oh, sorry. You know, go on. Sorry, there was go, a bit go, of a go, lag go. there. I, I didn't. All ah, right, yeah, no problem. Um, so you know, a lot of the a lot of the language we were talking about. But what fascinates me, and I was in a school in uh, Doncaster um, a good few years ago now, probably about twelve years ago, and there was a boy, a Roma boy, and he'd only been in England um, a matter of months, and we were talking away, and I was talking away about particular stories, and some of the words that I was using, he was saying in exactly the same way. So 500 years, and I'd never been to his country at that point. Um, and it was just fascinating to me that this language had stayed intact for five, never been written down, you know, un until the Victorian times when certain people took it, um, like George Borrow and stuff. But um, he actually got a lot of words wrong because there was a, as, as my old granny would say, there was a little bit of divilment going around. So he would sometimes give Romani people coins for their words. And of course, they'd give him words that weren't particularly um, the right word, shall we say, um, for his mm -hmm. money. Um, mm -hmm. So there are, yeah, that, do not get your Romani from the internet. <laughs> right? No. We because... need to get it from a different kind of freedom, a Romani story. Can I just come to a couple you, you of, do. I'm going to come you to do. a comment by Chris um, Dyson, just because while you're talking about being competitive and who's been around the longest, he just said, you haven't got the best job in the world. He has. But of course, he's wrong. I have. So we all think we've got the best <laughs> job in the world. And isn't that the best job ever when you think you've got the best job in the world? Yeah. Um, yeah Kelly, um, sorry, Kelly here is asking about whether you would ever write outside of your culture. And maybe I can ask a question on top of that as well. You mentioned a second character or from history that you would like to write about will you write about them so that's two parts really kelly's asking um, would you write outside your culture that's that's a well i'll answer the second point first if i can the other the other character the other person i would have written about was a man called john jack cunningham who was a, also a gypsy person born in a wagon um again in sort of late victorian times and he was a a world war one um, Victoria Cross awardee. Um, but when I looked at the voices, the collection of voices, there was already one about a soldier and I thought uh, I perhaps need to do something different. I, I write out of my uh, culture all the time. Um, so, you know, there are lots of children's books. Um, I think there's some around here actually, because I, I have my own, uh, well, I'm a, a corner of a publishing company as well called Tra Trails of Tales. Um, so this one here we've we've just done, which is called, if you can see, it's called Whatever the Weather, and it's about Cumbrian sheep, uh, and there is no travellers in that at all. Um, <laughs> you know, you 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 write about what what you know, and you also write about what you like, and I'm always conscious because I'm one of those people when when I when I hear somebody is writing about Romani people, but they don't understand the culture, you know, what we might call cultural appropriation. So, you know, I'm always conscious of doing that. Um, so I, I wouldn't write um, about other cultures. You know, yes, um, you know, British, UK culture, whatever we want to call it. I grew up in that. I get that. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, lots of my characters um, and, and my books and my plays and my stories. Um, I'm actually writing a story at the moment about a Selkie, um, you know, which is a kind of Scottish. You know, one of my, my grannies was, was mm. Scottish, so... Um, and they were always talking about these selkies. So that you know, the 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 traveller storytellers kept a lot of the the stories going, but mm -hmm. a lot of the no, well, some of the stories aren't traveller stories. Um, but but it's my culture, and I love it. And 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 you know, as Nikki was saying, there isn't much out there. Um, so you know, I, I don't just write about that, but I do love writing about it because. I just remember things all the time. Every time I write something like this, then I'm just thinking, oh, yeah, I remember that, I remember that. Stuff comes back to you, um, mm. you know, in your memory from when you were a little kid. It's a, it's a really good question. But, yeah, I'll write about anything that I'm interested in, you know. Um, Can I just ask you see something that I think relates to that? Um, but it's about people that have written about – you mentioned Peaky Blinders. Um, yeah. 
what came to my mind was Philip Pullman and his Egyptians, which are his people on narrow boats, essentially. Um, do you think you've been... I don't necessarily want you to, you know, write to talk about particular TV or, or books, but have these been more problematic than helpful? I suppose that's what I want to ask. Yeah, I think I, I, I think they are because I think if you're going to write fantasy, total fantasy, then you know you can you can you can do whatever you want. But I think we're we're at the stage where, as as you know, let's call it romlet. Um, you know, we're really really at the early days of it. So we, it would be really good if we were really established before people started dipping into it. Um, you know, I would never write a a book like this about an African uh, or Caribbean kid um, because I, I think I'd just get it totally wrong. You know, it, it just wouldn't be for me. I think there'd be nuances, there'd be uh, social mores that would I, I just wouldn't feel and and you know for somebody picking up a book like I pick up quite a few and I get I get sent books to look through as you know, get sensitivity reads I don't do them anymore because they would just make me angry that somebody has copied and pasted from the internet shoved it in and this will make it you know more exciting more interesting you know and, and we're more than just adding a bit of flavour. Mm. We're more than you know we're not just a goal to if you want something exotic in Britain let's do the gypsies. You know, it's it's some of it is just lazy. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't do the sensitive reads anymore. Mm -hmm. They just they just you know just get too much. Um, There's a lot coming through on the chat. I just want to again, it's a comment rather than a question, but I just want to uh, mention Sarah Merchant, who I think you might know, but uh, she said obviously from Romani heritage herself, and that she knows a lot of those words, but she's never seen them written down before. So. Thank you. What an important book it is, she says. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Appreciate it. There's, there are just lots of things coming in that are sort of very positive uh, comments. Um, let me just quickly. Oracy is so much so important. That's another one. Um, oh, Kieran's got another question here. What about Gypsy or Romany or Traveller women? as center characters <laughs> well that's 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 a real that's a really good um a good point kieran and and yes i have written quite a lot about that i wrote um a play um and it's in a book called roma heroes and again that's that that's part of the independent theater company they produced that from hungary and i wrote um a book based on a, a traveler woman who i who i know from scotland who between us and lots of others, we, we got the law changed. Um, and I wrote a play for her, a monologue. And that was actually performed in um, in Hungary. Uh, and it was all filmed. You can, you can get it on film, but it, it'll have a translation. Um, but yeah, strong, strong women characters. Absolutely. You know, I, I was very, very lucky that I was brought up by strong women, you know. And, and, that, and, and in traveling communities, that's another thing about... I think a lot of people from outside the community, they, they talk about traveller women as being submissive, as being that, as being this, and it's just not true. Um, but yeah, if you get the chance to watch, um, it's called Sorry um, is the Hardest Word. Uh, mm. And if you get the chance to watch that, it's quite a powerful piece, actually. So yeah, we, we performed it, performed in Leeds, and then we performed it um, over in, in Hungary at the theatre. And it was really interesting because the British ambassador came to watch um, the performance because it was at five monologues from different uh, Romani traveling people in Hungary and um, and he was just great Ian he was called and he sat with us and I thought wow what's going on here I'm sat in this lovely little theater like a bohemian theater in Hungary and I'm watching my play being performed in Hungarian sat next to the British ambassador I thought my dad would not believe this he would never in a million years just would it's not fantastic believe. Just while we're talking about when, uh, women, there's a little episode in uh, your book, which I really loved, and it's where they're talking about the Gypsy Queen. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you know, the, the mother is saying, imagine that, you know, they, they, they'll they have to come and bow down before the Gypsy Queen. And then it says what they do, and they're laughing because every woman is really a queen. <laughs> I yeah. love that. It's, it's one of those love. It's one of those lovely old myths, you know. There'd be a big funeral, 
and uh, you know in the old days even now but in the old days big parade a funeral all the travelers would come because you know they would be the matriarch of the family more women were in charge than men actually and um, they'd say oh, you're know, like oh, 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 the locals say, oh, oh the burying who is it oh it's the gypsy queen uh, but they meant it was their queen, you know, it was the, the queen of their family. But in Sheffield, in a place called Baton, there is actually a big pub, modern pub called the Gypsy Queen. And they called it after um, a supposed gypsy queen who was buried in a local church churchyard. And me and my friend, um, uh, a folk singer, uh, George, George Hoyle, great bloke, we actually wrote some folk songs. And, and there is a song called Gypsy Queen um, about oh. her. She was a formidable woman, amazing. Now, woman. I know the pub very well, and oh, I know the you? name of the pub. I do, but uh, <laughs> I did not know that. I'm going to go looking now in the. <laughs> I'm going to go looking in the graveyard next time I'm up there. So let's have a look. Just see if there are any final questions. There are just lots of really well, nice. Well, while you're looking, I'll just because yeah, while you're looking, yes, Kieran. Um, uh, another yeah, another answer. Yeah, we we wrote a song about a very very strong woman as well. So we've we've written um, lots of different things. Excellent. Well, while I'm just waiting, uh, just to let you know, we're in the, to the last few minutes. So if you want to get a question into the chat, please do. And while I'm waiting, just to see if there are any more, I'm going to take another quote from the from the book I won't say where it's from um, but it's Liger and he's thinking about the inspiration that Rab Howell has been for him and he says the only way we're going to change people's minds and hearts is by sharing sharing with them who we really are it seems to me that stories are one way of doing that it seems to me that your whole work is 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 doing that um, but on the other side, it seems to me not enough people are doing that. And, and you've talked about people sort of hiding, um, you know, their heritage. And in a way, that seems a shame because we're not getting that opportunity from many different directions to find out who people really are. Sorry, it's just a statement, but I, I'm interested no, no, to know whether you agree or not. I am. I am forever hopeful, you know, uh, positive in, in that sense that we've got a lot of young people coming through now. They are way more articulate than I am. They are way better educated than I am. They're, all of those things, they're amazing. You know, I was I was in Berlin um, in October and, and, and meeting some young people there, uh, some young Roma people. We've got gypsy and Irish traveller young people in this country doing amazing things. Um, I'm very, very, but what I need to do um, before I get way too old um, and disappear forever um, is to make sure that, you know, that this this huge um, back catalogue that I've got, not only printed, but, you know, on laptop and, and all that kind of stuff, that hundreds of stories that I've created and, and what have you. Um, I, need, I need to train up um, lots and lots of younger people to be able to deliver them so the stories go on and they create their own and so on and so on so that that's 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 my next part of my my work Brilliant. um yeah i mean the, the first stage was to be able to get you know when we did the first picture books was to do even more and then we've got the publishing company and then we've got you know the wonderful uh supporters of scholastic and um and another you know bloomsbury uh we're publishing with bloomsbury we're publishing with lots of the the the, the main publishing companies now they're, they're aware of it and and they're not just being nice you know we, we mm -hmm. have to people like me have to produce good work you know, those days of just being uh flavorsome um have mm -hmm. gone we have to produce good good work um so yeah that was any are there any other um questions or comments there nikki before we yes sonia wants to know what is richard working on now has this book influenced your next project well that sonia that's a really really good question and um, what happens is what has happened with me is that every time i've published a book then it's opened another door or two this one will open up some more doors. So I don't know what those doors will be just at the moment, but they will. But my my passion is always for storytelling. So I love writing. It's great. It's fantastic. But if you said to me today, you have to make a choice between writing books or telling stories. And if I only had to choose one, I'd, I'd do stories. So, you know, no matter how many books that or where this goes, or I mean, I think this would be great for TV, actually. 
um, and, and uh, you know, it's the sort of mm -hmm. Billy Elliot of its uh, of the Romany world, perhaps. Um, but you know, story for me, and and, and being with schools, and, and and again, as my role as creative lead at Seven Stories, which is the National Centre for Children's Books, I think uh, I'm probably the only person who has a position like that in in the country. Um, it's just to keep going and doing more storytelling and getting better, and um, and there are things that I would want to do, um, but they're they're story related. So there are there are lots and lots of things I'd I'd like to do, um, but they're not about winning awards. They're not about getting um, you know medals or anything like that. It's just about doing. I'm just I just real I just every day I realize how fortunate I am to be able to do what I do. We're we're incredibly privileged to do this kind of thing. You know, we get paid to, to do a lot of the stuff that we like, and that's huge. You know, mm -hmm. um, it is just, a, it's an absolute privilege to work with teachers, to work with children, to work with parents, to work with all the different people in organizations that I work with. I'm just very, very privileged in that sense. Which is a nice way to round this up because I get the opportunity to say, well, actually, it's been a real privilege to talk to you. So it's privilege all round. It's been a real privilege to have this audience with us who are obviously so engaged by what you have to say as well, Richard. And although they're not all teachers, I know many of them are. And in a way, they're the conduits that will enable as well young people to feel that they can um, give of themselves so that they can influence the minds and hearts of, you know, their, their peers uh, as well. So we know they do such a fantastic job in, in that way. So um, I am going to give thanks in a moment, but I'm just going to tell you a few little things before we bring our evening to a close. And we're going to hear another uh, reading from Richard to read us out of the event. Uh, I just want to tell you about a couple of up coming events very quickly in case you're interested. Our next launch is an evening of poetry with James Carter and Brian Moses and, and their two illustrators, Ed Boxall and Neil Layton. Um, so if you want to participate in that, have a look on our Eventbrite page. And then slightly different, our Audience With series, we've got three events coming up uh, very soon. SF Saeed on Friday. And then Kenneth Oppel is joining us from Canada and Sean Tan is joining us from Australia. Details of all of those are on our Eventbrite page. So um, thanks to everybody this evening. As I say, Richard is going to read us out. And once he has done, that is the end of the event. So if you want to leave any comments, um, I'll post them to Richard afterwards. Please leave them in the chat now because we all get ceremonious, unceremoniously, I should say, booted out when the event ends. So thank you all very much. And a special thanks to you, uh, Richard, for this evening. It's been my pleasure. And, you know, all these teachers to you, fantastic teachers who are even, you know, doing this overtime tonight uh, on your own time. It's, it's Again, we're privileged to have you and, and everybody else. Thank you. Um, I'll read you the author's note because it's really important, I think, for children that we don't sugarcoat a lot of stuff, especially as children get older. And it says three nil down. One of the reasons I wanted to write this book is because I love the game of football. The other reason is because a former England player, Rab Howell, is a real-life hero of mine, and also the hero of Elijah, the book's lead character. Although 100 years apart, Rab and I, we have a number of things in common. We both worked in professional league football. He was a player, I was a trainer. And we were both born and brought up in traditional nomadic Romani communities in the north of England. Writing this book allowed me to look at the history of professional football from a unique angle. It reminded me that if you come from a marginalized community, you often have a number of challenges to overcome. Or to use a football analogy, you're starting a game a couple of goals down. Sometimes these challenges also come from within your own community. If you're trying to achieve something unusual for the community, perhaps from your parents or other family members who disapprove on cultural grounds, or simply don't understand why you have chosen such a path, these can be the biggest obstacles to overcome, as you are now starting the game three rather than two nil down. Just like Elijah, I too had to deal with challenges when it came to being involved in football. But also like him, I found my desire for the sport was too much to deny. As tough as things can sometimes seem, remember, just as in every football game, no matter how many goals down you are, until the final whistle blows, you're always in with a chance. I hope Elijah's journey provides inspiration for your own journey.